Hi, welcome to Almost Cooperstown. I'm Mark. And this is Gordon, and we love talking about baseball. Welcome to Off Season Episode 2, and after a season where road trips were probably pretty different for most teams that I'd imagine in any general given season. Like, you had to go through all the protocol, the, tr- the, the rules surrounding travel Some were different. Some people got into trouble. Yeah, so I'm sure that was a very unusual thing for them to deal with and even going into next year i imagine you're going to see if road trips still affected and changed because of the you know covid situation but if you think about it that's actually despite the game of baseball not having changed that much actually traveling around for road trips is probably something that has changed the most around baseball like that's so vastly different from where we first started out considering they started before they had cars right 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 and 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 to think that you know they they traveled by train uh, and we'll even show you an interesting one where they travel by boat uh, one season, you know, to to play Major League Baseball games. The fact that it's been around for um, well, baseball over 150 years, but road trips, you know, in, in, since the 1890s and 1900s when they re- really started traveling around to places, the trains. Uh, planes, uh, automobiles, all of that uh, are used to travel. And, and obviously it was different before the onset of leagues and more specifically scheduled play with coordination between all the other games. Because back, you know, way back in the day, it was just teams going around to play other teams. It wasn't coordinated as much. So, yeah, they were traveling around, but you didn't have this travel schedule every team in the major league was adhering to and that's what it really got into as you moved into like the early 1900s and stuff and and you know the there would be off the field challenges for managers right when their team travel because you're away from home you're on the road in the city and you know you play your ball game you know, however many hours a day that makes takes you but there's lots of other hours in the day for you to uh, flit about town as it were you know and do things and uh, drinking was uh, a big part of that and bed checks were a big part of it and players doing things you know that they shouldn't was also a part of it I mean it's something that you even see today obviously you know there's always the stories swirling around you know like the NBA and what James Harden does depending on what city he's going to but you know every player in every league is cutting out when they go on road trips especially to big cities so i think the difference was back then it was not nearly as easy to keep track of them Absolutely. Well, actually, there were people that knew that was going on, and we'll talk about that when you think about the sports writers who were were following the team, traveling with the team at times. Um, they knew a lot of the times what was going on, and then they felt that they sort of had a gentleman's code to not – talk about certain things, write about certain things. A, a, a gent- it was a gentleman's code and an act of uh, self-preservation just as much because if you ever did start talking about that stuff, nobody's talking to you anymore. Well, and, and you might find yourself uh, with a couple of broken ribs and a, and a couple of broken arms as well. Yeah, oh, you know, wandered in the wrong part of the city on the latest road trip. So, yeah, in, uh, in we, 1901, the AL's inaugural season, uh, teams traveled between New York City and Newport, Rhode Island by boat. Um, early in the 20th century, Newport, Rhode Island, hosted some Sunday games, which Providence and Boston did not permit at that time. I, I love the fact that they couldn't even play on Sundays. <laughs> you're just, you're still not most of baseball, a lot of the time, were Sunday games where the people would come out and watch. I mean, yeah, especially because there's almost something iconic about a baseball is on Sundays afternoons. Like, it just seems like that goes together. So uh, I, I don't think the yeah, that would really catch uh, on in terms of boat travel but uh, after that it was train travel and and there's some epic road trips uh, even though for the longest time until 1958 the furthest team west were the St. Louis Cardinals and the furthest team south might have been the Washington Senators I'm pretty sure that that's the case so you really you know didn't have to go as many miles as, as soon as the baseball expansion happened all of a sudden you had all kinds of but you were flying by the mid 50s by, by the mid so, yeah, yeah teams were regularly charged flights i think by about like the mid 50s because the first team to do it was actually the yankees in like the late 40s and like 46 so like if they were doing it then certainly by the time the expansion rolled around you in the 50s you were going to have actual chartered flights for most of the teams and and you know so you know you'd have grueling road trips before that on the train and there's a talk of an early 1900s uh, road trip by the tigers and ty cobb the game, a 22 game road trip in 21 days over six cities that ended the regular season. The team wouldn't sleep in their own beds for over a month. Uh, or, uh, so, it, you know, that kind of stuff wouldn't be done today. And there certainly is no other sport, right? Think about it. 
what other sport has anything like baseball in terms of its road trips? You know, the NBA has NBA NBA is like talks about a week. week, It's like an eight game road trip is like this epic road trip, and and it is. And we've had some unusual NBA situations where they may have had to go on because an arena was damaged, so they could have been on for you know. But in general, not like baseball where you regularly have two week road trips throughout the season. Oh, totally, yeah. Because if a two week road trip is four series yeah, yeah four series road trip isn't that unusual. and a lot of those were west coast you know east coast teams traveling to the west coast and vice versa yeah exactly because it may and that's just being economical if you're going to send you know the mets out to the west coast you're going to have them play a bunch of the teams when they're out there just because it makes sense to do that and and you know the the uh, the plane, which really didn't come around to the fifties, you know, it, it allowed it, the train the train travel to foster unique relationships, like like we said, between the players and the writers, who would sometimes travel on the train uh, with the players and see what's going on, but also get some really interesting stories that they might write about uh, sooner or later, uh, and they would know things, as we said, about the players that you know may or may not be reported, but there was an intimacy there, and the players sharing because the writers were much more influential at the time and which is why i i think there's actually that that's part of the reason why i think there's two key factors why players of you know yesterday are so much more mythologized like they turn into these larger than life legends than the players of today one of the reasons is that you you didn't have that many writers following the team around certainly not as many as today certainly not as many as today so a lot of times, especially on these road trips, there might have only been like one, maybe two guys follow, depending on how – because think about it. Like how many guys were probably following around the Mets or the Yankees, like more the Yankees during like the 30s and 40s? Well, well yeah, right. They, you would have in New York because it was, a, it was a big city, you might have three papers and they might have three different writers. So that mm-hmm. would be the most you'd have. But if you were in another city, you had maybe just one paper. But well, you might not have been able to afford to send your to writer send your guy. traveling so around a, a, on the road. Spe- yeah, so a team like like St. Louis, they might have had a couple guys that wrote for the paper when they were in St. Louis. And everybody read the same people. That's the other thing because you only had everybody listening all to the same voices so you the, it allowed these players every, since everybody was reading all of the same things you, everybody had all of the same information so it wasn't like today where you if you want to read something on Mike Trout there's a zillion different competing sources if you want to read information on Mike Trout so that dilutes the general ability to, to add because players don't get nicknames the same way because of that. They're not able to produce a lot of these really famous quotes because of that, because you don't have everybody wants to put out a different quote so that they get the most clicks. So you don't have everybody just all reading the same one. And, and the, you know, the, 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 Quotes that we've got, we've got a few pretty good ones uh, over the years, um, were given to reporters uh, a lot of the times because they were in proximity to these players uh, on an everyday basis. So they would hear things. Today, they won't, don't have that kind of access. And, and because you, you saw the same guy right. day in and day out. He was the one traveling around with your team. It was, the relationship you would have with that guy would be much – because his livelihood was just as dependent on you – so he wasn't going to put any. So you were able to have a much different relationship, I think, than players have with the press today. Certainly, yeah, yeah absolutely. And and there were you know there were players. Um, Ralph Kiner, we 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 love Ralph Kiner here in, in New York as Met fans because he was um, the um, an original Met broadcaster and a, and a great Hall of Fame baseball player. Um, also famous for saying things that uh, you know were just really crazy and, and nutty more than crazy uh, and and interesting. And and so you know you you got stories from him about what it was like to be on the road and sleeping on the trains and what they did to rookies and you don't really hear those kinds of stories now because you don't get that kind of intimacy with even with your teammates and you think about the way players travel now and how they are on the road well i think that also just comes from the way baseball players are different today i mean think about you know a baseball player back when casey stengel was playing might have like what like a second job probably yeah yeah that's like, true like like today that'd be unthinkable they're all making so much they're making more money than god some of them at least it feels and like. your reputation a writer could ruin your reputation and 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 endanger your livelihood as a baseball player if you're not a star player and and say something that could get you into trouble um and and so we we had some opportunities to you know look up some great quotes one from ralph kiner we were talking about so and and, and you mentioned casey stengel so if casey stengel were alive today he'd be spinning in his grave that's a ralph kiner original <laughs> so all of his saves have come in relief appearances <laughs> 
Real, uh, he's almost like Stephen Wright. A yeah, yeah, bit yeah. Like, real enlightening quote there. Uh, you know what they say about Chicago? If you don't like, you don't like the weather, wait 15 minutes. Yeah, well, that's been said about every city. So yeah. I don't know how R- Ralph Kiner got that one. This one was a Ralph Kiner. Home run hitters drive Cadillacs and singles hitters drive Fords. That's a pretty good quote, actually, I, I, because it, at the time it was very, very much endemic of like, you know, the big power hitter would have the big power car and so on and so forth. And, you know, uh, Ralph, Ralph Kiner, uh, you know, was pretty good. The, the, the other famous one is two thirds of the earth is covered by water and the other third is co- covered by Gary Maddox, who is so, a great outfield. Yeah, yeah, it's great because you hear that all the time. That's now used in the NFL a lot with great cornerbacks. So it's interesting how that's been, you know, taken from one sport and brought over to another. So you could talk about. Ralph Kiner for a while because he said a lot of funny things. But let's let's talk about the start of, of road trips uh, that you said by air, and and you mentioned the Yankees, and they were the first team to travel a, on a charter. Yeah, charter, not the first to do it. Right, right. Overall, so just the, the Reds did it um, uh, by airplane. I don't know if it was a commercial flight or what they had on June eighth, nineteen thirty four. Nineteen thirty four. That's that's impressive. So it made me think that, you know, there, and it turns out there were some guys that were afraid to fly, you know, and you never think about how the impact was, you know, like, you know when that maybe they wouldn't, wouldn't want to do that. Yeah, like John Madden. Like, yeah, like, and John Madden did that well. That was like, a, like around like the beginning when, you know, regular, you know, person, you know, passenger air travel was becoming a real thing. John Madden, you know, it had been around a while by the time that was becoming. So that was fun. weird, but here you're a player in the, in the 40s and, and then the 50s when it really starts, and, if you're, and there were some guys that were afraid of flying. You had to somehow do it because you didn't have other options you know if you wanted to play professional baseball you could say well i'm sorry i can't go to the away games yeah i don't think that would go over with teams particularly well wasn't going to work so you you might try to drive to the ones but you're supposed to travel with the team Mm -hmm. um and and so uh that happened in the late 50s where really you know commercial airlines were looking for passengers and they made deals with baseball but before that the 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 trains they ruled the roost for years and and it was pretty uncomfortable um and a lot of these trains if you if you had the double sleeper right two beds in in a bunk the rookie would get the thing on top because that's where all the dust was and it was hot and uncomfortable and it didn't really matter it was going and and you would get the worst berth on the train and you're supposed to you know make these train trips and and show up in a town and shake it off and go out and, and play a game and they didn't think anything of it because they felt their life was the greatest it could be because they were professional baseball players today that would be a hardship beyond belief for any major league player to think you're that's the way you're going to have to travel yeah hop on a train go you know a, a long time probably for some of these rides hop out of the train play three games before hopping right back on and heading somewhere else i don't know if during uh coronavirus season if there was more or less train travel um i seem to recall that one of the teams might have traveled the, the, even the mets or the phillies by amtrak uh, up and down and, and there are still some some times on the eastern half of the country where teams might take uh you know train uh you know uh, uh, but it's mostly the, uh, uh, buses i guess if you know if you're the mets going to philadelphia you're gonna you're gonna take a plane no i don't think so yeah i don't think so but, uh, I, I think it would be tough to sell them that you're gonna take a tour it's a three hour you know bus ride though yes yeah i i don't see certainly well, today they'll you know and and of course uh you know the uh st louis being the furthest you know city west you would go on road trips and you would cover these cities by train and and the train rides were f- quite lengthy you know so you finish a game you know you, you you grab something to eat uh and you then hop on the train and you travel overnight you know into these into these cities uh that and i don't know how they got you actually i should know this from the train station i guess you took taxis right to the hotel they, or they chartered a bus the they probably could charter buses and your team had its writer probably with you on on the road trips whenever possible if you allowed it which most teams did yeah i'm sure and i'm sure it was the kind of thing where like depending on the season they probably played favorites like there was probably a writer that was allowed to come on the train with them and then maybe you know other times they were annoyed so they'd make the writer find their own travel the next city because they could yeah yeah and and because of what you said before which is really important is you know this stuff wasn't reported so people could do things players could do stuff that they couldn't get away with now because it wouldn't nobody would ever find out about it and and unfortunately that had a lot to do with the devil water liquor um and back in 1903 ed delahanty the who was the greatest hitter in baseball at the time um and but a big time drinker he fell off a bridge after being ordered off a train due to drunkenness and his body was found the next day at the bottom of niagara falls this is a I believe a Hall of Fame baseball player. Maybe I'm not sure about that. I'll have to, have to but check that. that. Yeah, like that's something that I mean, theoretically, it could still happen today, but it wouldn't happen in the same way. 
I right. feel like. Well, it could happen. It's just that alcohol was really the the drug of choice, if you were. No, yes. So and and yes, uh, Ed Del Henty is, was not a Hall of Famer, but uh, was the best hitter. This is you know obviously a long time ago, um, but that is the you know how, how low it got when people went out and, and drank too much. And then mm-hmm. you heard about all the crazy you know gas house gang teams were a partying team, and the Yankee teams in the fifties and they were partying teens in terms of going out and drinking and being at clubs, and it was glamorous to a certain degree to do that. To, and, and it's, it's also anymore. for a lot of them because of the way information traveled and the mm-hmm. way it got you know spread. He could go and cut loose in some random city halfway across the country because nobody back home is ever finding out about that. Not unless you do something so egregious it makes national newspaper, which would be pretty hard. And, and players did have, you know, the proverbial girls in other cities, you know, and 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 there's some just it's hard to think about because it's just not that way today because you couldn't get away with it today and and and, and, and hopefully people, players are, are smart enough to know that, that they it, shouldn't it's not even also that you couldn't get away with it people culturally just would look differently on that like you know a, a baseball player that kept a mistress in another city today would be looked at very differently than a guy that did it back in the the, the you know the early 1900s and 1910s yes yes absolutely and and you know we we talk about the major leagues and primarily this this is a show about the major leagues but you think at the minor league level it was even tougher to travel right because your accommodations were less your, everything your, was just yeah just everything knock everything down a level <laughs> everything was less the food was less um you know you, you the stipend was less like you know these the money kids. was less oh. the accommodations were worse i can only imagine how you know just scrounging around for a meal and you're getting you know what we, we think would be laughable money Ooh. to play baseball you would just take the money because you just wanted to play and you You'd get on some crooky old bus and travel. So the major leagues, and 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 that was you know talked about you know, in in Bull Durham about going to the show. You know is about how somebody carries your bags for you, and you have first class accommodations, and how all these minor leaguers were like, oh, it would be so amazing to go and be in that situation. So road trips, you know, definitely you know were as you went down the ladder, it got worse and worse and worse. Oh, I mean that's that's the tough part too because then. If you're the minor league team, you're also probably going to cities that are not nearly as equipped to handle having a team coming in. Instead of going to St. Louis, you're going to some much smaller town somewhere in Missouri, probably. Yeah, and and, and which closes up. They roll the streets at 8 o'clock, or there's only one place. And Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. Oof. Not, not a good thing. So um, I guess um, we could talk about a few more of the, the interesting quotes, because this really started uh, as – you know, baseball quotes and uh, malapropisms, thinking about Ralph Kiner and Yogi Berra and all the crazy things that they said. And, and we, when we really talked about it in, in more depth, we felt, you know, it really is more about why we heard these things and how we heard these things and do we still hear these things. And and so as we've talked about, it's it's more a function of the, the writers being within earshot and hearing these people do these quotable things. Um, there's Twitter you know, uh, now you, you you basically have it going all all along in Twitter. You and, don't have memorable quotes. And that I think it's also everybody saw, which, which which is as much a function of the fact that you know if you have people putting out pithy things on Twitter that are like I think some of these things would have just been really popular Twitter posts, You're right. but because. It was the only things you would hear right. from these players. It just became something that stuck a lot more. And say, say you know, say the U.S. was you know uh, uh, 150 million people through the mid 1900s or whatnot. So now we're over 300 million people. You have that many more people. Twitter as a distribution network or any other social media platform for that matter reaches so many people so much faster, you know, than, than a newspaper, you know, than a hand me down story, you know, that was written, you know, in a newspaper and then retold a hundred times. So, uh, yeah, Yogi Berra, uh, I think it's my favorite was uh, I never said most of the things I said uh, because so much was attributed to him, you know, that, you know, 90 percent of this game is half mental. Uh, you know. I mean, you can observe a lot by just watching. I, I like that one a lot. There's, there's a lot, but it's like it's like these like uh, there's definitely a word for this type of like statement where it's just like something that like it's like uh, at first it doesn't make sense. But then when you think about it, you're like, oh, OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and, and, and I actually uh, if you come to the fo- when you come to the fork in the road, take it. I, I like I like that one a lot. Uh, and, and he's also attributed to say um, it's deja vu all over again, which. You know, that's hard to me to believe that Yogi Berry gets it. That's, there's a lot of them. Yeah, that nobody he, goes there anymore. It's too crowded. How can he have all of these? The game isn't over till it's over. That too. That's just so. Why does Yogi have all these great things that you know is attributed to him? And how true are they? He he even denied that it was completely true. But um, people like to give him the, the the cred. And I mean, some of them are just like weird, like 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 
it's like the kind of old timey sports wisdom that you hear passed down like Lasorda with like there are three types of baseball players those who make it happen those who watch it happen and those who wonder what happened yep like like yeah i i guess but not really anymore because that, that, i think that was more indicative of a time where like you did have much clearer stratifications of players on your team if you have a starting player on your team in modern baseball it's they're not bad at baseball like they kind of used to could be. Right, right, right. And 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 so would you get a situational humor, you know, you get, you know, a, a line that, you know, you think, yeah, that kind of crystallizes. Uh, Bob Lemon, uh, who was a, a great pitcher and a, and a good manager, uh, was, was quoted, I've come to the conclusion that the two most important things in life are good friends and a good bullpen. Yeah, and then you have like the quotes that are about baseball itself. And I think these are where you get something that like it, it's a little bit more meaningful, like Humphrey Bogart with a hot dog, a hot dog at the game is worth more than a steak at the or a roast beef at the Ritz right and 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 that's so old I mean that has to be from the 30s but or something like that th- th- there's a meaning behind that right that's right. a lot deeper than right Yogi's goofy scenes. emblematic of America and baseball and and what we say we went we want to go and to what, the ball game and have a hot dog we're an informal or what this people. guy what this guy values you know saying like you know what I'd rather what that means to me going to the baseball game and having a hot dog means more to me than having a really nice dinner at the Ritz uh, and then people Rose was quoted apparently to have said, I'd be willing to bet you if I was a betting man that I have never bet on baseball. He, he, he actually was quoted saying that. Yeah, which, 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 which Pete, it's not a great argument. <laughs> you know, if you had one that had to be left with, that's not the one you really wanted. So, um, yeah, and, and, and the you know, Dizzy Dean back in the, also in the 30s and all that had some, you know, great quotes and he was a homespun guy and, and knew that he was, you know, quotable and sort of played into it. You know, uh, it ain't bragging if you can't back it up. Uh, that was that's really good, and and then he invented the word slud, um, which is what the past tense of slide. Is the, he instead of slid, he slud into third base. Uh, so uh, and Dizzy Dean, um, you know, also famously, uh, I, I guess his brother was a pitcher, uh, and after his brother uh, pitched a no hitter in the second game, he pitched a one hitter in the first game. He said, "If I'd have known Paul was going to throw no hitter, I'd have thrown one too." <laughs> Like it was a choice. Exactly, exactly. So you don't get those kinds of quotes or that kind of knowledge across such a wide berth now because baseball was the sport that was written about and and played in the nation's conscience. I'll also say this, and I don't know how accurate it would be because it's, you know, obviously none of these things would have been published. But I also imagine the guys that would say a lot of the things like that. What probably weren't written by the writers that were their friends and they, you know, wanted to make sure that they had a good reputation with them were all the misses and the things that, you know, they probably couldn't <laughs> put in the paper. Like, I'm sure Dizzy Dean had some really funny, colorful the statements. The outtakes would be great. But there's some outtakes, too, that for Dizzy Dean's sake were a good thing nobody ever heard. So, um, uh, before we finish, do you know, I, I don't, I was thinking, um, there was famous for bed checks back on, on road trips, right? You don't have bed checks when you're in, at your, in your home. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, Matt. Managers would go through the hotel and knock on your door in the middle of the night and make sure you were in bed. Do you think they're still doing that now? Do you think think, um, uh, Dusty Baker is walking down the hall... Uh, in in of the Houston players and knocking on the door going, are you in there? (laughs) Probably not. If I had to guess, one, you hear about players out at the clubs too much nowadays for me to think that's the case. And my guess is it's probably – they're probably able to look at it and figure out their rules a lot more and being like, OK, you know what? Because you know what? If I had a, a Saturday night game, Sunday day game, and I, you had a bunch – because I'm sure I would tell some of my star players like, you're getting the day off tomorrow. Letting him know he can go out and ha- enjoy himself that night. And the players know that one probably one of the quickest ways to lose your teammates' trust – is to go out and party so hard that you're then affected the next day and you can't bring your A game. I, I think that's a good point about self policing, actually, uh, and, and and being being accountable, you know, to your teammates. Uh, I I don't know that this is the day and age where they're going to have bed checks and whatnot. I think the, most managers would have to manage their team, saying, "Look, you're a man. Take you know, take care of yourself." You know, and the onset of superstars also yeah, makes it yeah. really hard because, yeah. like. You think Bill Parcells could have bed checked Lawrence Taylor? Right, exactly. It's a long, it's a long time ago. It's, it's funny that you used that because that was exactly what I was thinking. That's a, there's no, no Taylor rules, you know. And, and those exist. Those still like, exist. But that's what I'm saying is because those would exist, you're going to come up with policies that actually work because you know, if you're 
the Angels. And I, even though probably if there's one of the few guys in the a, a major leagues that I don't think is going out to the clubs and cutting out crazy is probably Mike Trout. But if Mike Trout wanted to do that, what are you going to do? Tell him no. Well, <laughs> one of the things I always admire about Derek Jeter, you know, through his career, uh, is being a great player, superstar, handsome guy, and you know, uh, you know dated a lot man. of beautiful women. Dated a lot of people never got married until after he was done playing. And I thought, right, because you're not going to be a hypocrite. You're going to, you know, if you're just going to kind of have a good time and, and enjoy people, and you couldn't find the person, whatever it was, mm -hmm. you know, but it was he just didn't get married, and it would be really hard to maintain a relationship in a family. It's got to be really hard for these guys. Forget about this season. You know, in any season on road trips when you're away for two weeks at a time and you're trying to you know do you, you get you go to spring training for a month and all think about how disruptive it is to the families depending on and how they it's not it. like the like when he's on those road trips he's going to be in a state of mind for maybe more than 10 15 minutes to be dad and husband he's just going to be baseball player in those modes i think that's a great point so, so many people forget how difficult it is to play major league baseball and what it takes to prepare yourself to be a player every day and and that's what you're dedicated to now more than ever right you can't you can't take time off you have to be working at it. there's somebody coming for your job even more than it used to be and probably now where where it kicks in where we're, we're missing your family where it gets really hard is the fact that with travel taking and being so quick you're going to have days and periods of times where you're you are just sitting around in some other city not doing very much it play, used to be playing cards you know playing cards you know and yet now guys you know and because baseball players on average tend to trend older it, you know you're gonna have more guys with more established families it's not like the nba and the nfl where you've got 25 year old kids that are the superstars of the league so luka Doncic is fine going back to his hotel room and playing you know fifa on his xbox after the games the same way that guys that are 35 and have kids probably which you still have guys that are verlander probably isn't thinking about going back to his room playing xbox when he's at home well, especially now with Kate up there. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I'm not sure he's the right example to no, use. No, he's just—he's an old guy. That's good. That's I, why I, I, went I, with I him. get your point, and I think basketball is probably a good thing to to compare it to to a degree because you know you could see going on the road for a couple of weeks, you're away from your family, and you have camp. so there's similarities. Yeah, football, you know? it's it's you're gone for. Yeah, five different. six days probably for the maybe, most part right most, you know you may have that, a couple of week road trip if you play two games on the west coast and maybe you didn't run and, back and forth yeah and even then probably most teams are coming back yeah, and i don't think they do that as much as they used to in, in terms of saving money on travel at the nfl level they make so much money mm -hmm. but yeah in, in baseball i think you know yeah they they do have you know the, the connection to the family uh, is definitely you know, not as easy during the regular season. And, and this particular season, it was kind of different because of, you know, coronavirus and, and how uh, it was managed. Which, which is why I think people really, I think, you know, just as a closing thing for me on like the coronavirus is you have to give a lot of respect to the NBA guys because they willingly made that decision to be like, I'm going to go X amount of time with having no chance to see them. So even the baseball guys got to go home after, you know, maybe two weeks. That was a couple of months. That and they and that you give both the N NBA and the NHL to some, you know, to a large yeah, then, credit because the bubble thing the way they did it, it worked that, and it should have worked more than anything else at least this it, it makes the most sense for that to be the like, thing that baseball's works. gonna be hard football's had a really hard time and and, and that was always gonna be so many people the fact that it's only been as bad as it's been yeah, is it's, actually it's, somewhat it's, impressive it's been it's been, it's been, been largely non-disruptive to the season outside of a couple teams and games so hopefully we'll get back to a time where we'll just have regular old road trips and we'll talk about the occasional antics yeah as much as i would love to have heard about the antics and the stories of the 86 Mets if they were around today they definitely not would have there not was gotten that away time with they stuff. got thrown out of, um, oh, we won't go there yeah <laughs> <laughs> thanks for listening subscribe to our podcast on your favorite platform and you can follow us on Twitter at almost coop <laughs>